All right, we've talked through the derivation of uh, Gaussian mi mixture models and the learning process using expectation maximization. We've done some examples, uh, and now it's time to play with just a little bit of code. First up, we're going to look at that same five cluster data set that we've been uh, working with over the last few videos. Okay, I'm working in the same uh, notebook that we were uh, before. Um, what we do need to do is add one more import. So from sklearn mixture, we need to bring in our Gaussian mixture distribution. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring in all the data again. So this is the data that we had uh, before. That's our five cluster uh, data set. And uh, let's also bring in our arrow data set. We'll use that here in not too long. Okay, so I'm just gonna drop down to the bottom here and create a new area for our Gaussian mixture models. And again, we get to define how many clusters that we have. And we'll start out with two. And I'm also going to set a parameter called n init to one. Uh, this parameter uh, determines how many times we execute this whole process. So, so remember that uh, we're starting out by making some guesses about what our initial distribution parameters should be. Sometimes we guess really poorly, and it actually helps to try a few different times. Uh, and and in doing so, then we at least will get one that uh, performs quite well. So the Gaussian mixture class will actually give you back the, the one that works well. All right, so let's go ahead and fit that data. That actually returns relatively quickly. So one of the parameters that we can get to is the, uh, the set of means. And there are mean locations, negative uh, seven, seven, which if we pan back up to our data set, negative seven, seven sits right about in here. And the other is 2.6 and 4.5. 2.6 is about here and 4.5 sits about right in there. So that, that's probably, those are probably reasonable centers for our two Gaussians within our model. All right, let's go ahead and uh, actually predict class labels. And we're also going to just plot this. We're going to hand those cluster means to our scatterplot function and it'll show us those two. Okay, so there we go. So, uh, this actually gives us a very similar answer uh, as uh, one of our earlier models that we were playing with. Our soft boundary k-means gives us a similar sort of answer. Um, and nominally what we're doing is dividing up the space into two uh, regions. And each of them is nominally a circular region. This, this is a little bit skewed in this direction. This one is an, a bit more of a circular type of a region. Okay, so let's bump up uh, the number of Gaussian distributions to three and see where that takes us. And there it's, it's done a reasonable job of partitioning up the space. Um, it's interesting that we have sort of this region here in red and this area here that's distinct in, in red as well, but nothing in between. So one has to kind of wonder whether that's a, a stable solution. I'm gonna run that one more time just to check that and nothing really has changed there. But I suspect once we go up to four classes that uh, we'll get a class over here and a class in this middle area. So let's give that a try. So there's our four. And there we go. Indeed, it split that one class into two different pieces. So if we add a fifth class, a good question as to where that uh, should be going. Uh, when I generated this particular data set, I actually had uh, five different Gaussians I was sampling from. And one thing you might notice is that we kind of have this region here. We've got a lot of dense points 
uh, and then a region over here that sort of merges with that one, but it's uh, much more sparse. And that sort of suggests that that's where that, that uh, fourth and fifth cluster really are. So let's, let's give that a try, see if the algorithm discovers that. And there we go. So it's actually done a, a, a good job of uh, discovering this dense area versus this uh, more sparse area. A, a good question as to whether or not this is stable and not that this is the perfect test, but we'll execute one more time. The colors have switched up, but the boundaries, I don't really see any changes that have been made to those boundaries. In this particular case, we happen to know that the underlying data set had five Gaussians in it, but we don't necessarily know what that uh, number should be. Let's bump this up to uh, seven just to see what happens. And, and you can see now we're starting to really grab a hold of some of the finer structure in the sampling that probably is a bit more incidental. And now if we bump this up from seven to say 10, it'll do that in more of an extreme way. And at this stage, if I were to execute this again, uh, we probably would end up with uh, quite a different set of answers, especially say this decision here between the, the green and the orange uh, clusters and probably uh, the precise details here or this set of three clusters. So let's execute that one more time just to see what happens. So we still, we still ended up with, so, so things did change over here. We ended up, I think, with an extra cluster in this area here on this execution, but we still have the three uh, in this area. So, so, so the, the, the point here is that especially as we're adding more and more degrees of freedom to our model, we're going to tend to overfit the, the data in more uh, substantial ways. And depending upon what our initial conditions are for our models, we, we're going to find different kinds of solutions. And, and in particular, we'll find very different solutions uh, if we have uh, more of this overfitting kind of a problem.